I'm Rip Esselstyn, and you're listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. Today, we get to know Dr. Michelle Loy, a nationally recognized physician with board certifications in integrative medicine, lifestyle medicine, medical acupuncture, and pediatrics. Wow. And as you can imagine, she treats her patients with a virtual buffet of modalities, which includes a fabulous intersection of Western medicine, along with practices like yoga, acupuncture, cupping, pet therapy, and of course, plant forward culinary medicine. We'll dig into her fascinating work right after this message from Plant Strong. Friday night is pizza night in our house. All five of us make our own pizza using the super handy Plant Strong pizza kits. Our kitchen island is transformed into a smorgasbord of toppings, and each of us then plays Picasso with our respective pizzas, coal of spinach, tofu, and then a swirl of barbecue sauce. Hope is all about the onions and the olives, and Sophie loves tofu, spinach, onions, mushrooms. She likes a lot of it. We play board games while we wait for them to cook, and then we pack up the leftovers for a quick, easy lunch on Saturday. If you haven't tried our pizza kits, each comes with a freezer bag so you can take and then bake what you need, and then you freeze the rest. They also include five packets of perfectly proportioned pizza sauces to go with each one of the crusts, and they can literally go from the freezer to the oven to the table in less than five minutes. Having a pizza kit on hand means that you never have to ask for what's for dinner tonight. And each crust is a wholesome whole grain base for whatever toppings your family wants to eat. Our goal at Plant Strong is to help you make meals that you feel good about serving to your family. Pick up a pizza kit and much, much more at plantstrong.com. When I first started researching my guest today, Dr. Michelle Loy, I was blown away by the array of expertise that she has in treating everyone from pediatrics to geriatrics. She received her undergraduate degree from Harvard, her doctorate in medicine from Weill Cornell Medical College, her pediatrics residency training from New York Presbyterian Hospital Cornell, and her adult and pediatric integrative medicine fellowship training from Columbia University Stanford Hospital. (laughs) In her practice, Dr. Loy focuses on the whole person and uses evidence-based therapies from both modern medicine and time-tested traditional modalities, including culinary nutrition, yoga, acupuncture, and mind-body medicine to prevent and manage chronic medical conditions. And I'm talking about Anything from allergies, joint pain, headaches, and IBS, up to PTSD, eating disorders, anxiety, and cancer. I sincerely appreciate her open mind, flexibility, and attention that she gives to each and every patient that she serves. And I know that you'll be as fascinated as I was to learn about some of the treatment modalities that she uses to help her patients heal. Please welcome to the Plan Strong Podcast, Dr. Michelle Loy. All right, Michelle Loy, welcome to the Plan Strong Podcast. It's an absolute honor to have you. Where are you uh, tuning in from today? I am tuning in from the New York City area, and it's a true honor for me to be here with you today. Wonderful. Now, are you are you at home? Are you at the hospital? Where are you? I see a plant in the background. I'm at home today. Uh huh. Yeah. And you like plants, don't you? I love plants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. What do you love most about plants? <sighs> I, mean, I know that's a very, very general question, but if there was one thing about plants, because you know, you know more than just about anybody I know about plants. I'm just wondering, what is it you love most? I love plants because they're alive. Um, <laughs> yeah, they I, love, are. I love the greenery. 
Um, I'm especially passionate about plants related to food and food as medicine and spices and herbs, things like that. But um, I, I, I love having plants in my home and in my room. Um, I, I think that plants just bring life. They, well, you know what? You're right. They're alive. Do you think that plants have personalities? I think they do. I think they do. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a gardener. Um, I don't actually have a green thumb at all. Um, so, um, uh, I try to pick plants that are very easy to, to grow. <laughs> right. Um, right. but yeah, I do think plants have personality and, uh, you know, um, it's funny. I have different plants around the house and actually some were given from a friend and uh, I have little sticky notes saying like, uh, you know, how, how often to, to water them. And, you know, <laughs> they're, they're like people. They like, you know, they're, they have personality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and you know, we just took on, I should say we adopted about four or five different trees, like what you have right behind you there from a, a good friend of ours who was moving out of town and he had all these marching orders like how to take care of it and this one needs to go inside this one's outside this one needs to be watered you know anyway everyone had a certain uh <laughs> protocol that yeah. needed to be followed yeah michelle i, I i'm fascinated with 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 you and everything you're doing in medicine. So I'd love to know a little bit about your background. So tell me, where did you grow up? Did you grow up here in the United States with, uh, with parents and brothers and sisters? Yes. So I grew up in the United States. I'm um, of Asian descent. Um, my dad is a scientist um, and my mom was a dietitian. Um, but I grew up in the U.S., uh, in, in the New York area. Um, and I was always interested in health, um, especially in high school, um, learning biology. And eventually, I, um, after college, I decided I went, wanted to go into medicine. So um, I went to medical school at Cornell. And then I stayed for residency in pediatrics uh, there. And then after doing some uh, uh, private part-time practice in pediatrics and um, raising five kids. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided, and as I observed um, the state of pediatrics and the patients I was seeing and the chronic diseases and the, you know, different physical and mental cognitive conditions, um, I decided um, that I wanted to go back and do a fellowship in integrative medicine. And so that's what I did. And I got training, um, board certification in that, in lifestyle medicine, medical acupuncture. Um, and then I came back to Cornell um, a couple years ago, three years ago now, as faculty. And so now I do 100% um, integrative medicine. I see adult and pediatric patients in integrative medicine one-on-one. -on -one. And I also run a number of uh, group medical visits in lifestyle medicine and um, prenatal health and women's health and mental wellness, um, mm -hmm. acupuncture, um, qigong, yoga, what else, narrative medicine. Um, and then I do an, um, quite a bit of medical education with the medical students, the residents, the fellows, and also um, uh, I, I do a number of um, give grand rounds across the country and most recently at the American Academy of Pediatrics, I gave a talk on culinary medicine. Um, so I, I like to do a lot of education in that way. Also in the community, um, I started a walk with a doc program. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did a shop with a doc program, uh, grocery tour um, in an Asian grocery store for my patients, all free. Um, and I actually, I, I've, I, I am one of the lecturers in the um, E. Cornell a T. Colin Campbell plant, um, plant-based course. So, um, that's a little bit of what I do. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. I, 
I, frankly, I don't even know where to start with, with all that, except to say, um, are you getting enough sleep every night with everything you have going on? Yes, I prioritize my sleep. And speaking about uh, you know time in nature, that's another one of my passions and talking about the health benefits of being out in nature. But what I tell my patients is, of course, when we talk about sleep hygiene, um, you know, our routine before going to bed is very important, but I tell patients, actually, it's in the morning. You decide in the morning, actually, uh, when you will fall asleep because it's when you get, it's, it's a time you get light on your retina early in the day, sunlight on your, on your, uh -huh. on your um, eyes that actually sets the circadian rhythm in, into play. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I make sure I get, get, get sunlight early in the day, get some time outdoors. Um, almost every day, pretty much. Um, I used to be a fair weather person, but now even if it's raining or snowing, as, as long as it's not icy, I try to get some time outdoors. Um, so give, give me an example of what that looks like. So, so this morning, for example, what time did you wake up and then what did you do to get some sunshine or some outdoor oh, yeah. light on your retina? I'm early and I usually get get out and, and go for a little a run or I call it a jog. It's my kids say it's a jog. It's slow. It's slow. <laughs> but um and I will listen to podcasts. Actually, I listened to yours this morning, part of the the, yeah. the, the um uh the summary podcast for the um sure, sure. and uh or I'll listen to some music or um yeah. And uh so it's, it's really important to get light, light yeah. time. But what, what, so what time did you wake up this morning? Oh, um, it's usually around seven. Today was seven. It's been a little bit later, actually, because mm. um, winter season, I'm kind of just, yeah. I let myself, yeah, yeah. So, But I get yeah. enough sleep. I usually get, I try to get between eight and nine hours of sleep every night. Oh, wonderful. And that, I mean, that's pretty impressive, especially considering your, your schedule, all you have going on and the fact you have five children. Now, are these five children in the house still? Or are they out of the house? Um, so the, the oldest is in college. So um, but currently home on break. But so right now I have them all, all five and it's wonderful. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, 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 good for you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I thought might be interesting for our listeners today is because you have such a, a vast, uh, vast array of expertise and so many different medical modalities, what I'd love to do is, I, you know, I was going through and doing some research on you and uh, on, I think it was one of the pages for um, the hospital that you work with you gave a kind of an example of about 15 different um, patients that you saw over the last couple of weeks, just to give a variety of the, you know, uh, how broad your toolbox is and, um, and how you kind of tailor each, uh, each treatment or each prescription to the, uh, the patient that you're seeing. So do you mind if I just kind of go through and and I'll, I'll kind of give you a lob ball and then you can talk about it. Sure. Okay. Let's go All for right. it. Let, let's, let's do it. So the first one is, uh, it sounds like somebody came in, you, in to see you for allergies um, and migraines and you, you, um, you suggested culinary medicine for them. What do you mean exactly by, you know, culinary medicine and treating allergies and um, and migraines. Okay. So let, let me start off with defining yeah. what culinary medicine is. So I, I like to think of it as, um, blending the art of, of the art of cooking and food with, uh, the science of nutrition or medicine. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I think about it. And so how I usually, um, use culinary medicine in my practice. So one of the major pillars, I start with lifestyle medicine pillars first. So that's nutrition, physical activity, mind-body stress reduction, sleep, um, social connection, and minimizing um, toxic substances. But the first one is nutrition. And so with nutrition, there's food. And with food, 
you have, of course, plant forward, emphasizing vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes. Then I talk about herbs and spices. Then I talk about teas, for example. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole host of plants there. Um, then I may talk about, for example, um, mushrooms, right? Fungi and all the benefits there. Right now we're in the winter season. Immune health is huge. That's what I'm talking to all my patients about. Mm -hmm. So these are areas where I will, um, you know, use different. Okay. And then we talk about traditional Chinese medicine herbs and Ayurvedic herbs and spices. And these are actually very common in our in our pantry, um, you know, things like ginger, turmeric, cinnamon. I mean, you name a spice, I can tell you a, a health benefit of it. Um, and so specifically, you asked for allergies. So for the allergies, um, if it's if it's a seasonal allergy, um, we know from integrated perspective that um, foods that are rich in quercetin are very helpful for seasonal allergies. So things like onion, um, mm. apples, um, chocolate. Uh, there's a lot. If you eat a plant-rich diet, you're going to be you're going to have a, a diet that's rich in quercetin. So I'll I will mention those types of foods. I may um, I always start with food as medicine first. Um, supplements are supplementary. If somebody has a deficiency, then perhaps. But I start with food first. Um, if someone has um, a severe um, seasonal allergy. We might consider like a quercetin supplement or something, um, a supplement that has quercetin and stinging nettles in it, or um, another one, um, a bromelain. It's the um, enzyme in, in, in um, pineapple. So these Let are me, some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Let me give you an example. So like myself, mm -hmm. I live in Austin, Texas, which is considered like the allergy capital of the United States. And typically in late late december early january we get hit the juniper trees cedar mm -hmm. fever it's the cedar um i think these spores basically explode and i'm telling you uh michelle i am a mess like mm -hmm. you know the sneezing the mm -hmm. uh the runny nose the eyes uh headaches like mm -hmm. really severe like mm -hmm. it almost feels like daggers going into the back of my eyeballs Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm super interested in, in what I could do for that. So that acupuncture or acupressure is great for that. Different massages. There, there are certain points that you can do that can help with the, you know, mm. drainage. And then the good old neti pot. That <laughs> is really, really, really helpful. The seriously. Prof, let me tell you though, my wife is like, rip the neti pot, the neti pot. And I do the neti pot. I can do it like no problem. But when this hits, Michelle, I try doing it in, an, in the pressure that mm. is all of a sudden descends upon my nasal passages is so profound that I have to stop. I mean, it is, mm. do you know what I'm talking about or not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but all yeah. during the year I can nasal pot all day long and just go, you know, both sides, no problem. Yeah. As, soon as, this, as soon as this hits, it's like the pressure, it goes from like one to 99 and i just I, yeah I can't. maybe you, yeah i i would suggest maybe acupuncture acupressure and massage in that area to kind of yeah. help with the drainage yeah yeah and i know but, that this is not something that is singular to me half the people that are on my master's swim team which is outside are suffering from this and uh it is it is <laughs> it is systemic in 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 austin and i would imagine other places in the country um yeah Okay. All right. Well, hey, let's good. All right. Great. So let's move on. So the next thing that you talk about is um, IBS. And I think you just, you list, you list pain. I don't know if it's just pain in general or pain. And then you, the, um, the answer I think you have here is acupuncture or acupressure. Um, so for IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, or um, I mean, that's probably one of the most common um, complaints we, we get, um, people's and, digestion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, and, uh, that's interesting to me as some, one of the most common, uh, but yet not surprising because I mean, wouldn't you think most of that is because of the standard American diet? 
Yeah, that's a, a big part of it. That's yeah. a big part of it. Um, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you've heard about um, the FODMAP diet, I'm sure. You yes. know, the, and people go on that. And, you know, it, it is a therapeutic diet that can be used. I, I do use it for patients who um, have an issue, but I use it very for a short period of time because actually – a lot of the foods on that diet are really healthy. They're fiber rich. And if our diet, if our gut is actually in balance, mm -hmm. then um, we would be able to handle all those types of foods. So wow. it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be a diet that you, you stay on forever. It's only mm -hmm. because for the period of time when you're trying to restore your gut health and get things back to balance. Mm -hmm. and, and when you do acupuncture to help with this, are there certain points that you're always consistently going to on people? Yeah. So there's 400 some odd points, um, uh, um, acupuncture points uh, on the body and also on the ear. Um, wow. And so, yeah, I mean, how do you, how do you keep them all straight? Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> takes a, a lot of time to be you trained, but um, people often think, well, if you're having gut issues, are you like sticking needles on my belly? And actually the, the meridians for the yeah. acupuncture meridians run through the whole body. So actually one of the most powerful points for the, um, for gut, for the gut um, is actually on the leg. It's actually really? not. Yeah. Yeah. They call it to a suddenly it's, it's the, um, you know, three mile um, point. It, it's actually good for a, a lot of things. Very powerful point. And is it on the right leg, the left leg, both it's legs? Both. Both, yeah, and, and where whereabouts? Um, it's it's below the knee, a, f yeah. a few inches to the right, right there. Hmm, like on the yeah. shin area, or more kind of on, on the, the yeah, kind of the shin area. Wow. Yeah, it's great okay. for it's great for a lot of things. Yeah. Okay, so for myofascial pain, you recommend cupping. I can't tell you how many people in my life are getting cupping these days. Yeah. Well, and, you know. and it, it seems to be a thing. So, but, but I've never had it done. Um, do you think I should get cupping done? So, <laughs> so Michael Phelps made a very famous, um, um, actually I have patients of all ages who, at, who come for cupping. The, the, the teens actually really like it a lot. Um, cupping has been used for many, many years. You know, it's part of Asian medicine. Um, traditionally it's done with, with fire, like, you know, where they light the light, light a particular herb. We don't do that in the hospital. We use suction cups, but it's particularly helpful for, for myofascial pain, any kind of muscular pain, super helpful. Um, I, I've, um, I've had patients with, um, um, especially at the adolescence with any kind of, um, either like ADHD or anxiety or a lot of the, you know, um, mental behavioral type conditions respond very well. And it's especially good for um, seasonal changes, you know, during the winter, immune health, super good for that. Um, but it feels very good and um, people love it. Uh, it and yeah. And, and um, whenever I see, because cupping leaves some pretty, <laughs> it's like big yeah. hickey all over the, yeah. all over I, it's usually typically, I'd say 90% of the time I see it, it's on the back, yeah. but can it take place all over the body? It's usually on the back. It's usually on the back. So it's another way of moving what they call the chi, the energy around without using needles. So it's just another method of, of, you know, moving the chi uh -huh. around. What so. do you prefer? Do you prefer cupping or needles or both? Um, we'll, we'll use either or both depending on the patient's um, preference. Um, uh -huh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Same with acupressure, like for my pediatric patients or those who are, you know, needle averse, then acupressure is, is another way of doing it, you know. And, and is acupuncture, acupressure just where you take your fingers and you press down on a certain spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. On this, actually on the same points that you would put the needle, needles. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I've uh, even done it with like tuning forks as well, where you, for the vibration, especially for the kids. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and you see... In your practice, you see people from what pediatrics to geriatrics. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, I have a 90s, my oldest patients in their 90s. Yeah. Wow. That's quite a breath. Yeah. 
of, yeah. uh, of patients you're seeing. Yeah. That, yeah. And typically how many patients do you see a day? Is that how it works? I mean, or do you, is it, yeah. a, do you have hours Tuesday, Thursday or how yeah, does that? It, it depends if it's a one-on-one -on -one because we, you know, for, for new visits, I spend a full hour with each patient, which is, is wonderful. Um, and, but sometimes I have group visits and so there'll be more than one, you know, I'll be a group. An hour. That's a lot of time, Michelle. Yes, it is. It is. It I is. mean, as far as I'm aware, that's kind of unheard of that. I mean, that's fantastic that you do that. And I have patients fill out a very long intake form. And if they're willing to do it, they know my secretary tells them I will spend close to an hour to review it beforehand. So when I actually see them that hour, we're really honing in on, you know, their plan and uh, you know, how to help them in a very personalized way. Yeah. And, and, is this something that the your hospital approves of? That you, you, yeah, yeah, actually, I'm working. This is part of the hospital. This is something that our hospital provides, um, and most of our referrals are from other specialists within the hospital or primary care physicians. Also, word of mouth. Yeah, this is uh huh, and, and it's and, covered by insurance. And and remind everybody where you work. I work at Weill Cornell Medicine in the Integrative Health. Um, um, and well-being center um, in New York City, um, and I personally am licensed in three states: New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So, anybody in those states, we can see. I can see in person or through telemedicine. Yeah, can you believe what telemedicine has done in the last five, six years? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's and do you, and do you feel? I mean, there's probably nothing like having the patient there in your office and seeing them live and being able to look into their eyes and, you know, literally see the color of their skin. But I would imagine the next best thing is, you know, zoom or something like that. Yep. Yep. And, um, for some patients, they prefer that it's just easier. They save time, you know? Um, so it, it's been helpful, I think, to, um, you know, access and, and especially for our group visits for people to join from all, all you know, all over. You know, yeah. some of our patients are immunocompromised. Um, they, they, they don't want to be coming to the hospital unless they really have to. Um, and so being able to join, you know, virtually, it allows them to participate. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so earlier you mentioned um, anxiety and PTSD, which I know has kind of shot through the moon, especially after COVID. Um, I was just talking to a neighbor who was telling me about one of her children that has a hard time going to school because of so much, he is stricken with so much anxiety. And you talk about doing guided imagery that mm -hmm. to help with that. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Can you give me an example of what a guided imagery would look like? So, so guided imagery, um, sometimes I'll do it on, on its own, especially, especially with the children. And sometimes I've done it um, in conjunction with acupuncture and it's mm. just leading um, the patient. Um, sometimes it's a script where, um, you know, um, you, you kind of lead them on this imaginative kind of tour um, where it emphasizes different senses, what, what they see, what they hear, what they smell, um, and puts them in a kind of a, you know, a calmer state. Um, something related, which is called medical hypnosis, is what I consider guided imagery, but in a much more personalized um, mm -hmm. setting. And that has been really helpful for especially um, some of my pediatric patients with anxiety or OCD or um, PTSD, um, certain kinds of fears, um, especially because children are very good with imagination. Um, and, uh, you know, actually, I'll, I'll often say, um, we all find ourselves in hypnotic states. Like, when was the last time you were doing something? You were playing, you were reading a book. I don't count social media, but you were engrossed in something and your mom called you in for, for dinner and you didn't even hear her because you were so into what you were doing. Um, or for other people might be gardening or whatever, that, that is a hypnotic state. And we kind of use that where you're in that, um, you know, um, state of mind where you can, where we can make um, positive changes related to health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you, do you have any thoughts on why, 
why do you think there's so much anxiety right now in <laughs> in in our society? Um, what do you think is the basis for it? Yeah, actually, before I go to that, I just want to yeah. say, as far as the guided imagery, you know, the, um, athletes, which you are, they use, vid, you know, guided imagery all the time. They visualize like before, you know, a swim, you know, how they're, so that's, that's something that we, we know has been used for many, many years. And also with stroke, so our stroke patients who are learning with rehab, many times, you know, the, the therapist will say, I know you can't right now, you're, you're not able to pick up that cup, but I just want you to imagine picking up the mm -hmm. cup and mm -hmm. then you, you, you cause the, you know, neuronal pathways to, to, um, sort of reset and eventually they're able to pick up the cup and drink it. So, yeah, yeah. no, I can't tell you how much guided imagery I do without really knowing that it's, you know, guided imagery, but I'm just basically right. imagining myself all right, how do I want to feel in the water? What am I doing with my, with my breathing? What am I doing with my left arm, my right arm? Am I, you know, going through all the way through my hips? Yeah, all that. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So back to your question on why there's so much anxiety. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts since you, and especially if you're seeing it and, and maybe, maybe not to be so general because that's kind of maybe unfair, but maybe like in children, um, what's the stem of that? Um, do you have any thoughts? I, I, it's just multifactorial. I mm -hmm. really, you know, um, people are so busy, their families, like the connect, social connection. I think social connection is a big one. Actually, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably one of the biggest ones. And that's actually why, um, I do a lot of narrative medicine as in my practice as well as one of the tools because, um, you know, especially with social media, well, you know, with just technology, I mean, technology has been wonderful in many, many ways, but um, um, because especially kids are spending so much time on devices and instead of, you know, people used to play all the time, um, together or, you know, interact. And now uh, people are in the same house and they're texting each other or something, you know, like, or it's just the, the connection. I think the fabric there has kind of broken down somewhat. Um, and so I think that's part of it. Um, yeah. and, and it, we, we know that with, with, you know, um, people who are, especially kids who are not so much on social media, they, they tend to have less anxiety. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. The fabric has it's broke it's it's broken down and I think what is going on with social media, the amount of screen times that kids have, uh the the fact that they're not socializing out in nature. I know you're a huge fan of nature. Yeah. Nature playing out outdoors. I read I read a study recently, Michelle. I think it was done by Kaiser Permanente. And it showed that your average adolescent is spending, and I think this is actually underestimated, is seven and a half hours on a screen and seven minutes playing. Yep. Or I should say seven minutes moving. Yep. Um, yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it starts from very young. So there's um, a play and grow study I mentioned in my, uh, my, my talk um, with the AAP. And it was, they were looking at, um, these are like preschool kids and it was actually interesting study. They, um, they had them spend time outdoors and then they measured, it was pretty scientific. Like they were measuring their fecal serotonin levels, um, the different microbiome bacteria in their gut. And they basically spending time outdoors improves the you know, the types of bacteria in their gut and yeah. increase their serotonin levels. And then the study actually said that they were happier and a lot less angry or something like that. I mean, basically, you know, it starts when they're young um, and talk about nature and the, and the microbiome and, um, you know, even 
touching soil, like in gardening, that yeah. um, is a, you know, that can affect your microbiome in, in you know, I mean, obviously you should wash your hands free, but I mean, in a good way um, and spending time out in nature. And, and like you said, people are just, yeah, they're just spending time indoors all the time. Not, not um, yeah. kidding. You, yeah. you mentioned narrative medicine. What exactly is narrative medicine? Narrative medicine, um, it's actually, I, I credit uh, Rita Sharon from Columbia with, with the term, um, but I, I think of it somewhat like how we use, um, you know, either um, literature or music or art or broadly the medical humanities in, in, um, in healing, in, 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 um, achieving health and um so specifically there are many ways to apply narrative medicine um so for our patients we have a group visit where we actually um provide like a poem or a prompt or some music and we spend some time to talk about different topics they'll write and then share and in this kind of interaction of um of sharing and generous listening, um, we often can, um, you know, a lot of these patients may be dealing with um, some kind of chronic disease or, or pain or cancer or different types of grief or anxiety, depression. Um, and um, uh, using the human, the medical humanities, we're able to help with the healing process. Because, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, um, you know, well, for example, with we have a big cancer population, um, going through through cancer treatment is very, very difficult. Um, but generally, um, with time, the body heals quite quickly or, you know, we're able to, you know, um, you know, heal to some extent. But the the emotional aspects of going through the treatment can often be a lot more lingering, even to some extent, a little bit like post-traumatic a little bit. And so using narrative medicine, we can often um, help with healing, not only the physical body, but also the emotional. Mm -hmm. right? we're, 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 we're yeah. Three part well, I read, I, I read, <clears throat> you wrote a paper recently yes. and you talked about um, narrative medicine as a anecdote uh, to stress and burnout, um, mm -hmm. in, in actual like clinicians. Yes. Right? And you talk yes. about how prevalent that is because they're just, they're, you know, they're taking care of everybody. And sometimes maybe it's like the, the shoemaker <laughs> that right takes care of everybody's shoes except for his and his children's. Yes. But you have an exercise it's called yes. the, three, the three minute makeover, mental makeover, right. which, right. and I was, I was looking at them, these exercises that you propose. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to do this with my yeah. family. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, that three minutes, three MM, that was um, developed by, by a colleague, a, a pediatric cardiologist in the Midwest. So I, I don't yeah. take credit for that, but, but um, I, I did write about in the paper and yes, it's a wonderful um and you could even do these. Uh, I think they even have games like cards. I remember a while back with the kids who would pull out a card and, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't remember the name of the um, game now. Yeah. It was a number of years ago, but, you know, uh, what do you think about this? And then, you know, or, you know, so I think it's a good exercise to do definitely with, with yeah. your family or with your Yeah. yeah. And I just, uh, so the three, the three that you talked about in the paper were the first one was write three things that you're grateful for. You know, it's, it's, it's always wonderful when you can express gratitude um, and, and, yes. and, and thanks for things. We're, we're learning how beneficial that is. Uh, the next one, and this really kind of, I was like, ooh, this would be exciting. Write the story of your life in six words. Like, like come on, really? That'll, that'd be fun to try that one. And then the yeah. last one was write three wishes that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I really, I, I like that. So that's all part of narrative medicine. Mm -hmm. um, before I go on, I just want to say, I think it's so wonderful, Michelle, that you're, you have such an open mind, right? An elasticized mind to seek out and try and understand 
the benefits of all these different, you know, uh, modalities. And is that really kind of the crux of what integrative medicine is about? Uh, is yeah. Not hung up on one or two things, but looking at yeah. everything kind of, yes. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up because there's a lot of confusion of what integrative medicine is. Like, you know, is it complementary medicine, alternative medicine? No, it's not. So integrative medicine really, in my mind, um, mm -hmm. it is, uses the best of cutting edge modern medicine. And there's some things that, you know, modern medicine is just, is wonderful at, um, and also uses time tested, um, other tools in the toolbox, like, you know, traditional medicine, but it's evidence-based and it's coordinated. So it's not, it's not taking one, you know, sometimes patients will come and, and they think integrated medicine means natural and holistic. And so they think like, Okay. I mean, I've had this where you, they might think, well, you know, I have cancer, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the chemotherapy. I'm not going to do this or that. I'm just going to like eat plants. Right. Mm, that's not, you know, that's not what integrative medicine is. We use the best of both worlds, right? Um, I mean, sometimes people will make decisions and it's a personalized decision, what they will choose, but you know, you know, the reason why we're so well respected and the reason why we get so many referrals from the oncologist at our institution, and we're lucky to have integrative medicine, right? Actually, if you look at the um, NCI, the National Cancer Institute, the comprehensive cancer designated centers, they really value integrative medicine because um, we can use tools in the toolbox to allow patients who are receiving cutting edge the best therapy, but they may have some side effects or symptoms. These tools in the toolbox from integrated medicine can allow these patients to adhere to the treatment that their physician is, is recommending for them. Yeah. So ultimately for, you know, outcomes, it's much better survival. Yeah. When you, when you look at how much you've learned since you got into the field of medicine and how much you've devoted yourself to all these different you know, modalities. Do you see yourself ever slowing down and trying to learn the latest cutting edge thing that's coming out? Or do you think like in 10 years, do you think that we have just scratched the surface in our knowledge and all the different, you know, healing um, uh, methods that will be available to us? Or do you think we're like 90% there? You mean as far as the cutting edge modern medicine? No, I, I, I mean like there's like uh, I read um, Tony Robbins' um, mm -hmm. latest book, like Life Force, and mm -hmm. he talks about all these different things that are coming down the the pike that are going to allow us to live to 140 and 130, and you know, um, I mean, it was crazy, and I'm just wondering if you are looking out that far or do you feel like we're we're pretty good at this point we're pretty good as far as what we've discovered and the different methodologies and modalities that are out there uh, i mean i think in both realms as far as modern modern medicine and you know cutting edge therapies there's there's always going to be more or where we're just scratching the surface. I mean, immunology yeah. is an exploding field. The microbiome is an exploding field. We keep learning about that. Um, and in integrative medicine, I think you're at the intersection of that. Cause you know, we talk about the microbiome, we talk about food, fiber, plants, and how that affects the microbiome. Right. But at the yeah. same time, you have these like immunotherapy, for example, which for certain types of cancer, like melanoma, for, for those patients that respond, you can go from stage four to nothing, like mm -hmm. gone. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah, right. So, mm -hmm. and what I was going to say with that is um, what's really cool is there are some studies, there are several studies too, I think, at MD Anderson, where people who, those patients who are getting immunotherapy, who ate a plant, uh, you know, a fiber rich diet. Yeah, had higher disease-free survival rates and and a better response to the immunotherapy. So there's the interact an intersection between cutting edge modern medicine and and yeah, you know, diet. Well, let me ask you. You mentioned the immunotherapy. 
How long has immunotherapy been around? Do you know? I, I don't know specifically. I'd say in the la- it's been it's it's really exploded in the last like 10, 10, 20 years. Now, actually, right. one of our somebody at our institution is one of the main people who you know mm-hmm. um, developed it. So it, yeah, it was really exciting. We we both spoke at a breast cancer symposium um, for patients, um, and and for me to actually speak at the same conference with him who's like this guy I was just like wow yeah. to hear him speak about it but I mean that that's an example where it, the science is just absolutely amazing right well um, and it's funny you bring that up because we have a my wife and I have a good friend who had stage four bladder cancer and wasn't supposed to live six months and did uh, I think some immunotherapy up at MD Anderson and he's alive now eight years later I mean, it's, yep. in, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think um, Carter is another example or, uh, you know, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Right. So let's yep. move from immunotherapy to pet therapy. So you also do pet <laughs> therapy, right? <laughs> Which I love. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I, well, I, I don't know if I do pet therapy, but it's one of the tools in the <laughs> toolbox. It's one of the tools in the toolbox. So I can yeah. think of several patients where very complicated patients have seen all kinds of specialists. Um, and we've, I, I went through all of their medical history and all of that and, um, went through all of the, you know, lifestyle pillars. But in the end, um, several, in several cases, yeah. recommended pet therapy or, um, you know, volunteering at an animal shelter, um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. equine therapy horse, it, it, you know, with horses is really helpful for, um, children and teens with, um, anxiety, depression, um, even ADHD or autism, really, really helpful for that. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you, and what, what do you think it is about the horses? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's, there's something about that. Yeah. Well, there is something about, I know, petting the side of the neck of a horse that is so, you know, powerful and muscular and yet uh, f- typically friendly um, and those eyes and, and the heat that comes out of their, you know, their mouth and uh, their, their nostrils. There's something about horses that is fascinating. Yeah. Sure. I, and I can think of a, another um, situation where um, the patient was very, very depressed. They, they're, they were doing different types of therapy. Um, and I remember the patient saying to the, to the mother, you know, if I had like a pet or a pet there, you know, pet, I, it would give them a reason to live. Um, so it can be helpful for mental wellness. And then of course, just for physical health, like I think um, you're probably familiar with that book, Walking with PD or, you know, where, where right, yeah. where you prescribe like that they get a dog so that they can, you know, part of it is they need to walk the dog every day and the connection and all of that, right? Yes, so. yes. We, we, we got a cat recently and when this cat like sits on your lap and purrs and you're petting it, there's a, there's a connection that happens, right? Absolutely. That, that's Absolutely. very, um, it's very yeah. important. Yeah. Let's talk about, it. so we throw these retreats uh, twice a year. We throw these six day retreats and typically for people that are um, trying to regain, regain their lost health typical age range is 40 to 75, 80. And I'm amazed how many people they've never done yoga and we offer yoga and they do yoga and it's incredible what it does to, I think, energize, to open up. And I know that you for pain, you recommend somatic yoga. I don't know what somatic means, but I know what yoga is. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I use yoga a lot in my practice. It's one of the mind body therapies that I recommend. And, you know, I think of mind body therapies just like sports, like you have to pick the one that you enjoy. So yoga mm-hmm. is just one of the many, right? Um, but I do think that yoga, um, we have a whole group visit for cancer patients. So a yoga group visit for that. And actually we broaden it to include any medical condition. So there's a lot of pr- chronic pain, um, 
other conditions as well. But yoga is really good physically. Um, it, I mean, the way it works, it, it definitely um, strengthens the parasympathetic nervous system. So the mm. rest and digest rather than the fight or the flight. And we're in this society, we're in a constant sympathetic drive always the cortisol level is so sky high so yoga is very good with that of course it's good for flexibility and um you know for my patients with any kind of musculoskeletal pain or balance issues um um anxiety depression sleep all of that it can be very helpful um so I definitely recommend that. We uh, offer a particular type of yoga called um, somatic yoga, which um, is somewhat similar to if you are familiar with like Feldenkrais. It's like a, it's, it's a training the, it's a mind body connection where you're, again, it's somewhat related to guided imagery where you're imagining the moves and where mm -hmm. you're making a connection between the brain and, and the muscle. Um, but yeah, yoga is, is really, 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 really helpful. Um, and a lot of times I'll tell patients, um, you may feel that you may not feel like you're doing anything, like it's very low level, you know, um, you know, and especially for the type A type patients, the type A person like myself, sometimes I think oh, I have 10 minutes, I don't have time to like do yoga. I got to like, you know jump on the treadmill for 10 minutes, work my heart. But actually what we really need is that parasympathetic um, strengthening. And, and, you know, I'll ask my patients after you do the yoga, notice like, do you sleep better that night? Like many of patients, they'll say, yeah, they, they sleep deeper. Like, you know, things just get a lot better. It's mm -hmm. subtle, but the changes are real. Well, I find I sleep better, but I also find that my day is better. Uh, after a yoga session, I find it puts me into a really nice centered. Um, uh, I just feel very connected uh, mm -hmm. after it. You know, I think it's the breathing, it's the movement, it's the holding the, the, the postures, all that. And they just all yeah. add up. Um, what about, uh, are you a fan of Ayurve Ayurvedic uh, teas? I see for GI distress. Yeah, Ayurveda. So, so that's the the um, traditional um, Southeast Indian um, traditional medicine practice. So, yeah, for for um, a lot of our patients have um, indigestion, gassiness, bloating, and one of my favorite um, recommendations is something we call CCFT. It's three herbs, three spices: cumin, coriander, and fennel. That's it. Uh -huh. wow. And you can just stick it into hot water. Um, you can uh, sometimes I'll make my own. Um, um, like chai mar marsala, you know, it's like a chai tea, which where I just like add whatever I want, cinnamon, cloves, um, turmeric, ginger. What else do I have in my spice cabinet? Um, coriander, maybe, um, cardamom, you know, can add a little bit of soy milk if you want, whatever, you know, and just yeah. drink it. But these, these spices are very good for digestion. Mm. And that's why when you go to like Indian restaurant, they have a bowl of fennel next to the candy, like at the checkout, right? Because they know it's good for. Yeah, fennel is also very good for colic. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, I'm a big fan of of, of fennel for sure. Um, it smells. It always has smelled like black licorice to me. It, it does. It definitely does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, what about traditional Chinese medicine soups? Oh, there's so much. I write. I think I've nearly yeah. every visit we talk about this. Like, everyone's sick, has colds. They want to like know how to, you know, what to eat. So, a couple of things. Oh, let me start with star anise. Okay, for, for, let me let me first start with this. I always say um, that grandmas are very smart. It doesn't matter what culture you're from. Whether it's like, they'll say, drink your matzo ball chicken soup. They'll say, drink your doll, drink your um, black bean soup. Like what every, every culture has their particular soup that's healing that grandmas say to, to, to drink. And I'm convinced it's the vegetables. It's the garlic, the onion, the carrots, the celery, the spices that are in them that are good for immune health. I'm not just convinced I, the science behind it. We know mm. garlic and onion, that family of um, 
is very, very important for immune health. Same with mushrooms. We'll talk about in a second, but I want to mention my <laughs> spices. So I, I often tell patients, do you know that, um, star anise, it's one of the spices yeah. in Chinese, it, 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 um, we call it ba jiao. It has like eight, it looks like a star. Star anise is, um, one of the main components in Tamiflu, which is a medication we use for flu, shortens the course by day, is, um, shikimic acid, which is from star anise. And so here's an example of all these different spices you can put into your soups that are really good for the immune health. Another one I, I talked to patients about is mushrooms. Mushrooms we know are very, very good for the immune health. Um, mm. Two in particular have been studied for cancer, uh, yunzi and yunzi, which is turkey tail, coriolis, and um, reishi. Um, but actually all mushrooms are very um good for the immune system. They they should be cooked. You shouldn't eat them raw, but they mm. should be they should be cooked. And a great way is to put them into soups. Um, if you ever go to um like a shabu shabu or a hot pot, um, those are great because you can get like a vegetable broth, a mushroom broth, and then they have like it's like a buffet where all these different vegetables that you get, like mushrooms and all kinds of um Asian greens and um you know tofu and different things and you can stick into your Pot. Oh, it sounds it, it sounds awesome. Is that like a pho? Is that like a pho? It's um, pho is a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. Pho is yeah. It, it, it yeah it, it it's kind of like that, and that's the hot broth. Yeah. But then you get to cook your own. You know, I mean, some of these places have have meat and other things like that, or fish balls, whatever. But you can just you can ask for a vegetarian broth and then just put the vegetables in. It's kind of a fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, but the other thing for Chinese Asian soups that I recommend right now is adding some astragalus. So astragalus is a plant root, another plant that people don't know about. Um, it's it's a root, it looks like a tongue depressor. It has a sweet taste to it. Um, and you could just stick it into any broth that you like, you know, a vegetable broth, wh whatever you want, just stick it in there, cook with it. And it is very good for immune health. Hmm. Um, yeah. Now, now tell me this, when you are doing your shop with a doc, and typically this is with cancer patients. Um, are these mushrooms and the spices, some of the things you recommend that they put in their baskets? Yeah. So we just, um, we met at a, at an Asian grocery store and I, we started with a social plant power Metro New York. And we just started um, in the produce section. We probably could have spent the whole hour there, but yeah. I just went through and introduced patients to different greens that they had never seen before. I mean, if you go to the, it's not just Asian markets, other ethnic markets, you can get exposed to so many amazing. Um, tell me, tell me some green, some greens that maybe I don't know about that I should. Oh, um, I love pea, pea shoots. I just pea got a bunch shoots. of pea okay. shoots. They are so good. Mm. I just got some, actually bought it twice this week from the Asian store. Um, that's in season. I mean, there are so many different ones. Um, they have dandelion, oh, dandelion greens. They have or? dandelion greens. They have a lot of them. I only know the names in, 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 in Chinese, but you know, all kinds mm -hmm. of leafy greens, um, cruciferous vegetables, cabbage, all kinds of cabbage. Um, do, you, do you have, do you, Michelle have a favorite green leafy that you, um, are gravitate to more than any other? Oh, I like them all. I like kale. I, I like the, 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 the pea shoots a lot. Um, what about, what about broccoli? For, what about broccoli Bro for the sulforaphane? I love broccoli. I love broccoli sprouts. I love cauliflower. Okay. I love kohlrabi, bok choy. Do you, do you sprout at home? I do. I haven't done it in a while because it's the winter, winter time, but I was just thinking today yeah. um, that I'm going to start again, but probably closer to the springtime. I do yeah. because I told you I'm, I don't have a green thumb, but I can sprout because anyone can sprout. All you need is water and the seeds. Yeah. And, and sometimes it, it makes so much I have to like slow down because it's like well and time. I know and I know you don't have a green thumb but I know you're a huge fan of people gardening gardening and doing maybe indoor growing of things like sprouting right? sprouting it's exactly perfect. sprouting and fermenting those are two things that are really easy to do yeah. and yeah yeah um, let's move on to this is something that I, when I'm cold in the winter time. I love putting a lot of blankets on top of me in bed. 
Uh -huh. And you say there's a, something called weighted blankets, like that's a sensory yeah. in a, for sensory integration issues. Can you yeah. can you can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah. Weighted blankets are really helpful for people with sensory issues, especially um, patients with um, um, you know autism, um, even ADHD. Um, uh, Actually, patients of all ages, not just children, but um, yeah, they have these, they have weighted vests that, that children can wear. It can help mm -hmm. calm down their nervous system. Um, but a weighted blanket it, is wonderful. I, I recommend weighted blankets for a lot of patients, um, especially even if they have like restless leg syndrome, where they're kind of like twitchy. First yeah. thing I would say is check their ferritin level to make sure the ferritin level is at appropriate level. And then also consider a weighted blanket. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. What you just mentioned ferritin, which made, made my brain go to, um, are there, is there any kind of deficiencies that you see more than any other in your practice with your patients? Vitamin D is the biggest one. Uh, anybody who lives like north of, I don't know, Georgia, it, it, it doesn't get enough yeah, vitamin D. Everyone, I, I really recommend that people get their vitamin D tested mm -hmm. um, so they know what the level is. And a large number of patients are low or deficient. Yeah. And, and then when they're low, do you recommend that they supplement with Absolutely. vitamin D3 yeah. and, and typically yeah. what, D3 how much? D3 or D2. Yeah. It, so it depends on what the level is, but it really, you know. Yeah. Well, let's say my level. Okay. Let's play this game if you don't mind. So let's say that my level is 18. Would you recommend I supplement and how much? Uh, 18 is pretty low. So um, I, you probably uh, that might be a, cause there, there's actually an algorithm. So that might, you're, you're mm -hmm. getting close to where you might want to get a, a prescription for like a 50,000 IU once a week. Mm -hmm. um, but for mm -hmm. general, like most people, if they're just slightly kind of low, I mean, if there are a thousand I use a day or two, that's safe. Um, but mainly right. I like to test to make sure I know what the level is and I'll use the algorithm and see how much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, is there any other um, vitamins or minerals that you recommend people supplement with? Uh, B12, like if they are uh, completely plant-based vegan, then a mm -hmm. vitamin B12. Mm -hmm. um, those are the main ones. Um, and then what about, what about, what's your opinion about omega threes, the DHA and EPA? <sighs> that's a, that's a question I get a lot. It depends. I may use it in certain, um, you know, for example, anxiety or ADHD, some of the, um, those kind of conditions I might use it, um, in those situations. Um, but as far as like a, a supplement for, for general wellness or for everyone, it depends. It depends. I have to, you know, it's personalized. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. not one to just throw a bunch of supplements. More is not necessarily better. Supplements mm -hmm. are supplementary. If there's a deficiency, yes. But um, just to take a whole bunch of supplements, you know, everything needs to be processed through your body. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, more is not necessarily better. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice philosophy. I mean, I think if, yeah, I think that, that you know, I prefer people can get get it through their diet, you know, through chia seeds, flax seeds, right? Nuts, seeds that, you know, through omega-3 that way. Um, but, you know. Yeah, right on. Hey, Michelle, are, are your parents yeah. still alive? Yes. And yes. are they still in New York? They're in great health. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. They must be so uh, pleased with what you're doing with, uh, with, with your life and your family and, and everything you have going on. Is that fair to say? I think so. I, I, I'm so blessed to have them nearby and, you know, my kids can, you know, spend time with them and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. you said your, your mother, you said, well, I think it was a, uh, was it dietitian? dietitian? Yeah. 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 So yeah. wow. I mean, you guys yeah. must be able to talk about this stuff, uh, till, yeah. the, till the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And your father, you said, was he a professor? Is that yeah, correct? he he uh yeah, he's a physics professor eventually. Yeah, he's a dean of science at one of the universities. Yeah. Wow. So I, I the science part came from him, I think. And the yeah. love of food and nutrition came from my mom. Yeah. Yeah, what a what a great so, marriage of the yeah. two. Yeah. 
so what did you have for breakfast today, Michelle? Uh, typically my, my um, well, in a typical day, I'll just tell you kind of the stuff that I have. To sure. Love yeah. to hear so yeah. um, I always have usually, especially in the wintertime, a bunch of roasted vegetables, like always a cruciferous vegetable, a bunch of them, like probably four or five different. I batch cook a lot. So a bunch of vegetables. Um, let's see. I always have either some kind of bean, like a bean soup or I don't know, like some tofu, something like that. And that's um, for breakfast. That's for breakfast. No, no. I'm just giving a kind of all, all together, like what's in my day usually. Cause, and then, um, I'll always usually have some oatmeal lately. I've been cooking, um, um, making like stewed apples. So it's mm. like with cinnamon, all kind of stuff. It's almost like a dessert with that. Usually I'll have some air pop popcorn at some point. Um, what else? Oh, I've been making a lentil bread. That's been great. The lentil, wow. just lentil water, water, a little psyllium powder, and um, I'll put a no salt seasoning on there, or like everything bagel seasoning on that. Oh, and a little apple cider vinegar. It it, it makes rolls that it reminds me of like the the those Hawaiian rolls that you know yes. they they look yes. like, it looks like that when you when you and make so them. So what do you? What what kind of lentil do you use? Is it a red, a yellow? Yeah, I use red. I've used mung. I've used whatever. I've used even yeah. used a beluga because I ran out of the red one. You can do any use any of those. It works. Wow. Yeah. I'm, fa I'm fascinated with that. Hmm. Yeah, fruits and vegetables, like yeah. Yeah. So well, and would you say that your whole whole household uh, eats the way you do? No. Like, no. No. Okay. Okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> And but they're the very, they're, they're yeah. very open to plant, you know, and I, I yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, you have to, I, I use this um, quote, <laughs> lighthouses don't go around like, um, yeah, Anne Lamont says, you know, go around like, uh, you know, trying to save all the boats they you just have to lead by example that's what I've, I've learned i mean when they're young you can make it you can be very more prescriptive and all that but as they get older um i think learn you know providing options and um living by example i think helps and i've seen like with the older kids they kind of come around and they make that decision themselves you know and like oh you know i mean you know <laughs> If you've been to like a these college cafeterias, it, it's like crazy. It's like a, it's crazy. It's like a buffet with all kinds of, you know, pizza and chocolate fountains and all like all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, you spend a lot of, you know, you have to pay for it, whatever. And then they come home, they're like, "Mom, I really miss your vegetables. Those vegetables at school are too salty or too oily, whatever." And it's like, okay, you know, but it's not by saying. um, you can't have this or you have to eat this, that, that backfires. No, you're right. Um, it's better to be a lighthouse than a tugboat for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. What yeah. about your husband? Is he on board? Uh, he, 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 uh, he's very, he's more and more open. He's very, yeah, more and more open to yeah. plant, you know, to plant foods and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Michelle, I have really enjoyed getting a uh, a peek in, inside you know what you do and how um how skilled you are with all these different uh you know practices that that you um <laughs> enact on a daily basis from lifestyle medicine to integrative medicine to medical acupuncture pediatrics food is medicine uh it's really it's it, it's really impressive and uh, I just want to say that um, this has been a great hour. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to meet you and speak to you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Converse together. Yeah. And um, if people are interested in learning more about you, is there a, a website they can go to? Or if they want to, um, if they live in New York or New Jersey and they want to uh, see you, yeah. is there a website they can go to? Yeah, they can just uh, they can Google me on Wild Cornell Medicine and put my name in. I, I think Carrie will put the, the yeah. link in the show notes as well. Got it. Got it. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. you have a fantastic day, Michelle. Thank and, you. Um, you keep, too. 
Keep it playing strong. Hey, give me a little fist bump on the way out. Boom. There you go. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Rip. Dr. Loy practices at New York's Wheel Cornell Medicine Integrative Health and Wellbeing Center. And she is licensed to practice in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I'll be sure to link to some of her resources in today's show notes. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, let's all do one of the practices that Michelle suggested today. Write three things that you're grateful for, name three wishes, and try and write your life story in just six words. I'll start. Eat strong food and stay plant strong. The Plant Strong podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, and Amy Mackey. If you like what you hear, do us a favor and share the show with your friends and loved ones. You can always leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And while you're there, make sure to hit that follow button so that you never miss an episode. As always, this and every episode is dedicated to my parents, Dr. Cobble B. Esselstyn, Jr. and Ann Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks so much for listening.